All right, we're live. Um, welcome to Art Casters. I'm also hearing like a strange, eerie sound yeah. in the well, background. It's... Like All a right, hold on. radio station. I can it. <laughs> whistle. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, you guys. Let me mute myself and you tell me if it goes away. I think you hold should on. keep the ambiance. Um, when you hear strange, ghostly, ambient, 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 uh, vibes and sounds. I think it's just uh, the AC. It's loud. Probably, it could be an AC whistle, maybe. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna roll with it though. Okay. So, All right. Um, when you hear sounds like this, uh, it's it's not a late night radio station, but it can put you in a good mood to read some good old classic horror. Some of us like dinosaurs. I'm wearing a T-shirt with dinosaurs. And I didn't even realize how well timed that is. Well, not a T-shirt, but a dress shirt with little dinosaurs on it. And I was I was realizing that's serendipity. We've got on, ambient noise uh, that I keep wanting to call ambience, um, which is a really pretentious way of me pronouncing it. Um, and so we've got like this kind of horror late night AM radio station. You're driving on a road in the dark late at night. And who better to have as a guest on Art Casters than the very own Gary Hodges? This guy right Dinosaurs here. Dinosaurs versus Mars box. I love it. I love it. Okay. You've so, done AM radio, and now you're going to hear some stories about lights in the sky. It's pretty exactly. Cool. Yeah. So, so make sure you're buckled in, right? Yeah. And we're gonna we're gonna go through, and everybody's gonna introduce themselves in AM radio fashion. There we go. Did we do uh, it in kind of a a, a grave? Quiet. I like that idea. Yeah. Voice. yeah. Okay. Like All right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Joshua Kemble, and I will tell you <laughs> stories, stories of depression, stories of slice of life realities that have never been told. And the mere act of reading them might get you banned from life in general and welcomed to death. Yes, I make the books, Two Stories, and Jacob's Apartment, and you guys should check those out and make sure you're subscribed to my channel. And stay tuned while my co-host Corey Kerr tells you where to find his work. Corey, where can people find your tales of terror? Could we cue up some theremin music or something? Oh, can let me we... see. Let me see. I feel like I need to lean uncomfortably close yeah, to do this I intro so. i think yeah. so it's always it's very confidentially shared at this am radio i'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna cradle i'm gonna cradle the microphone like i would cradle our listener this is not theremin music this is like german dance music yeah that's not that's not doing it for me <laughs> okay welcome to the art casters late night edition i am Corey kerr and i'll be your host this evening I tell stories about the near future tech takeover that is already happening and that we've already accepted, soon turning us into cyborgs and transhumans. Are you like getting it. that? Can you hear that? Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah. That's enough. All right. All right, Scott. Greetings, mortals. <laughs> This is Scott with Cirqueworks Art Labs, and you have tuned into the Artcasters. I will be one of your hosts today, but one of four, and stay tuned because we are going to tell you the story, or stories rather, of horrific Comic Con experiences, or maybe not, so, or maybe not so horrific. We'll find out. Did it go well? Did it go poorly? Only you will find out soon. So, while I'm talking, I might as well mention that you can find my work at CircWorks.com. You can also find my comic book at, well, you can find my comic book at CircWorks.com. And you can find my video series, Making Comics 101, at YouTube. Just search CircWorks on YouTube. Thank I you. I love it. I love it. And that's exactly the kind of information that people do not want you to hear. And speaking of information that is banned, that, that should not be heard by mortal ears. And as Scott mentioned, there are four of us. Stay tuned to find out 
how it will become only three of us, and then shortly two. Which two shall survive the night? Stay, stay, stay oh. tuned. I didn't, so, that part, but... <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh no! Oh no! We lost Corey already. You guys, this is what happens on our late night broadcast. Sometimes we lose connection with some of our guests because the the deep state does not want to hear the truth, the truth that we are about to spill. And so, Gary Hodges, why don't you let people know how they can read class unclassified uh, documents? about the impending Martian invasion. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm uh, subbing for Art Bell tonight. Um, my name is Gary Hodges. And as usual, I'm here to bring you the most highly classified comics you've ever encountered in your heavily governmentally regulated life. Um, so I am the creator of Dinosaurs vs. Marsbots, D vs. M, which is happen it just so happens to be reprinted right now, partially in prep for the Phoenix Fan Fusion, which we're going to be talking about. Yes. If you go to my Etsy shop, you can get clean, crisp copies of both 1975 and 1997, and help keep me focused and motivated to finish drawing uh deep versus m 1979 which printed up test copies or filling this binder as we speak um so you can find me on instagram at dinosaurs vs marsbots which you see right there or on youtube under my name gary hoppus awesome i love it um Cool. All right. So uh, I have to say, I feel like you guys all nailed the late night AM uh, Christian radio station. And I somehow started waffling between that and like weird conspiracy theories. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. I think I needed to commit either. If I'm doing the Alex Jones thing, I needed to just lean into it. Um, but anyhow, so let's talk about Phoenix Fan Fusion and comic conventions as a whole. Uh, you and Scott both, I thought it would be cool to have uh, Gary you on uh, because you're a returning guest. You're awesome. We love having you on anyway. But aside from that, like um, you and Scott were both a little skeptical about comic conventions rather recently. And then kind of both like through circumstances we can get into, um, were sort of invited to like participate at Phoenix Fan Fusion. And then... I think both had a pretty good experience. So I want to hear um, the lowdown on like Phoenix Fan Fusion. I don't know how you guys want to go about it. If you want to go day one, um, uh, I, I guess we could just start with like, why don't we just like Scott and Gary, like, why don't you guys each just let people know how you ended up getting coaxed back into the con like just when that you thought you were out. They brought you back in. Oh, yeah. right. Let me talk about that at yeah. first. Uh, do you want to go first, Gary, since you're our guest? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, much like Scott, and Scott, I don't want to paraphrase too much or speak for you too much, but I think speak we both Scott. Kind of, we, we, did, uh, we did Phoenix Fan Fusion 2019 uh, and both left it a little disillusioned, and I think in similar ways. We both... I, I won't speak for you, but at least personally, I felt like this isn't where you go to hawk your indie comic. This is maybe where you go to do Robert Downey Jr. fan art. <laughs> or, you know, yeah. like I it felt like it was becoming kind of a very Hollywood TV oriented, celebrities autograph oriented comic. And I didn't like how they had broken up the floor in weird ways where you could attend Phoenix Fan Fusion and maybe not even be in the room that Artist Alley was, much less walk by your particular booth. So I I had done uh, Phoenix Fan Fusion every year for a few years. I think I was going back and I think I first started going in like 15 or, or something like that. It had been a while. Uh, and then was sort of over it. And then the plague hit and there was no real opportunity to go anyway. Uh, I had. This was the first big year back, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Scott. And I was just gonna attend as a 
a normie. I wasn't going to get a table. I wasn't going to do any of that stuff. I was maybe just going to walk the floor one for a few hours and see what was going on. But a couple of friends of mine, um, Keith Foster, uh, Kadoja fame, among others, and uh, Scott Lost of Second Shift and Wanders and Milisando fame, um, they had been tabling next to me in 2019. We hit it off. I've been on their podcast a few times. They reached out to me and they're like, hey, are you going to be tabling at Phoenix Fan Fusion this year? And I said, no, I'm skipping. Maybe next year, because next year I'll have the third comic done. And, you know, maybe then. And they're like, look, it wouldn't be the same without you. We can carve up a little space. Uh, you should just come on down for one day and just hang out with us and, you know, bring your books and, and uh, you know, hang out and talk. And drink some beers at the booth. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but when you're drinking beers at the booth, why not? And uh, like just, and it, it kind of sounded like exactly what I was up for. You know, I, there was no way I wanted to commit to a whole convention. And there was no way I wanted to like actually for like an entire table. But if I could go in on a little portion of a table and just hang out with friends for one day and only miss yeah. one day of drawing, it sounds great. You know, sure, why not? So uh, that's how I ended up there just Saturday. I did all day Saturday. Awesome. So, so you did a day and uh, and ended up there basically by invite. Yes. And uh, it sounds like kind of like a more relaxing kind of re-entry to the whole thing. It was a totally casual. Like I ended up buying them dinner and a couple beers, and like that was the trade, you know. And and I like and of course I would watch, you know, I would cover and help pitch people's books when they were going to the bathroom, and you know I I pulled weight, but otherwise I was just like. Just sort of chilling with some friends at their table, you know. Yeah, it's weird. Um, well, I I want to hear Scott, um, but it, it is weird, just inter and interesting to me. Like, to me, I I'm tending to think nowadays that like splitting or making sure that you have like some booth, uh, that you're boothing with other people, it's not a bad way to go. It's like no. pretty. Um, unstressful way but, uh, but before we kind of dip into that like scott what uh just when you thought you were out what what brought you back in yeah so uh similar to similar to gary I, the only i guess the difference is i i when i did comic cons i didn't just sell my indie comic um in fact even even when it was really good that was just kind of a one part of what i was selling but uh the difference for me uh, the things that I was selling because I was selling prints and things and but it was it was all my own IP which is really difficult at a show you know like this because for the same reasons people aren't so interested in discovering indie comics they go there to kind of see things they already know they like and not necessarily to discover new things um, so it was you know it was a really hard sell but I mean I did I always did fairly decent at these shows but it was trending downward and rather than just kind of stick with that, I kind of saw the writing on the wall. And not only that was, um, and I enjoy doing the shows and everything, but I tend to overdo things a bit. So I had a very elaborate setup to the point where even though I was making a profit when I went back and I thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm spending two or three weeks just setting up. Like I would, I would, you know, my living room, I would set up my whole booth to test everything out, see, make sure it's working. And I would just, every convention, I might do things a little differently. So yeah. there was just a lot of, a lot of setup. And when I factored in the amount of time I was putting into it, which I didn't necessarily have to do all that, but I kind of brought that upon myself. Um, and I just thought, you know, I don't know if it's worth it. You know, I think if I spent the amount of time that I'm spending with this other stuff, with these conventions and focus it on like, digital and online sales that yeah. I could easily, I could easily do better. And that's kind of the route that I took. And, and, you know, I, I was able to do pretty well with just that. So any, any profit or anything I made up, I mean, I, I made at a convention, I easily made up for with like on, online sales and things like that. But I do, I did kind of, you know, I knew I was going to miss the, just the the feeling you get from being at a con and, and talking with people and introducing your artwork it is it is a good way to for those that are interested in discovering new things to introduce that to them and everything and, yeah. and build sort of a presence and, and everything like that so um but like i said in two or like gary had mentioned in 2019 um i just 
saw things trending down and I had talked to other creators who were, could they kind of echoed that same sentiment? So I didn't re up now. I mean, I didn't know that the following year they wouldn't be a con, you know, cause yeah. usually, and, and that's the other thing, usually with these cons in order to secure that your same spot or whatever, or make sure you're in, you take, most of what you made, depending on how much you made, and you just drop it and you just give it back to them for the next year. So you, you really, you know, you only get, it's like, you don't really only get, you know, I felt like I cashed out, you know, Oh, I'm taking all this money home with me this time instead of, you know, giving a bulk bulk of it to back to the convention for next year. So, so I did that. And then that turned out to be a pretty good thing to me because, and I don't know the I assume the people that did re up got, you know, they just rolled over for the next year or whatever. Um, I think that's the case because surprise comics where I did uh, exhibit at um, this, this time around um, that, that that's what they said that they paid for their booth. Are you, are you guys hearing me? Cause my headphones are kind of, yeah. kind of, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, we can hear you. okay. Yeah. Um, and so, I don't hear like a creepy ghost tea kettle in the back. Yeah. The, the air, the AC went off, I think. Okay. Yeah, uh-huh. they keep it. It's like a freezer box in here over here at my girlfriend's place. So, uh, <laughs> oh, this will be even more haunted. Like, pretty soon it's gonna be like, like the the kind of the air, like, and, yeah, like, exactly. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so anyway, yeah, so that that's kind of my history with cons and why I decided to kind of kind of bow out. And, um, and I also I was in a, but I in the meantime, uh, what after kind of covid lightened up and everything i started doing appearances at at my comic store yeah and that was a good way for me to still get some of the stuff out of it that i liked out of the conventions uh um so they anyway my comic book store invited me to attend a table at their booth like they you know they're selling comics and everything and and you know they had me and a couple other artists kind of rotating and everything. I was there most of the time. And then, you know, uh, Eric Henson and another guy, um, another artist, you know, that we would trade and everything like that. So, and then I'd walk around and got to do all that stuff. So I thought that was, a, I thought that was, that was, that was intriguing to me because I, you know, for one, I don't have to pay for the table. I didn't even have to buy anyone dinner or lunch. <laughs> you know, I was kind of there supporting, supporting my comic store and everything. Um, and it just gave me a chance to, and I wasn't going there to really, I brought my comics with me, but I was mainly there to do the same thing I do when I do an appearance. And that's, you know, sign books that I, that I've done artwork for or do sketch covers or sketch cards or whatever. So, so I said, yeah, I'll do, I, yeah, that'll be fun to do. I got a, you know, free ticket for the weekend. I got to go out and go to, panels i got to just you know uh, what else just you know walk the floor meet people talk to people so it's kind of just like me going to the con as as a you know as an attendee but also get to draw and stuff and everything so nice. so that was that's how i i kind of ended up back at the comic con cool so they they got you back in there um yeah. all right so uh I like it. So, okay, you guys both through different circumstances, through previous connections, got kind of situations where you were you were at a booth at the con. Um, all right, Phoenix Fan Fusion, let me know how it went. Gary, how was how was your time at Phoenix? Um, and then, obviously, Scott, if any of what Gary's talking about relates to your experience, too, chime in. Like, um, yeah. My goal sure. is to try to have you guys kind of run this thing, and I'm okay. just going to draw. <laughs> well, so again, for the record, I just did the one day. Uh, yeah. I'll talk about my personal experience first before I talk about the uh, the anecdotes of um, Keith and Scott. Like, Because I kept in, you know, I was asking, well, how did Friday go? And then yeah. I was like, Saturday, and then Sunday, I was like, how did Sunday go? But so I thought this, since I had so little skin in the game with this, uh, I thought it would be an interesting science experiment to, uh, now I've never gone all out like Scott with my booth, but I do make the effort. And I have like a big banner that goes over the top. I have another banner that goes on the front. I try to do, I do all the things, you know, like the multiple tiers of merch, like I'll have buttons and stickers and comics. Sometimes I'll have some prints. Like I, you know, I, I do, I, I have like this, uh, green tablecloth that sort of matches the green and the branding you know i do the whole thing and um 
I also, like Scott, I'll set up, I'll tape out the table on my carpet and kind of figure out like how my, what my spread's going to look like. And, you know, like I know, like I try to get it dialed in. I work on my pitch. I kind of get in the headspace for it. This time, especially because I was in drawing mode, uh, I was like, I don't have time to like really do all that. You know what? I'm just going to ask the guys for like this width of table. Like they, it was literally like, I can show you the amount of table I had was about the width to let put two <laughs> demo copies side by side. Scott probably it. saw it two yeah. side by side and then a pile of business cards to either side. And then close up near me was a standy sign that had like prices, you know, and that was it. Like I, yeah. I was like, and that's all I'm going to do. Cause I'm not going to kill myself over this. Like, I'm just going to like, see what happens. I'm not in the program. Like nobody knows I'm there unless they walk by. So it's yeah. only going to be strangers I'm pitching to. And I haven't been sitting and doing the head prep for like weeks ahead of time. I've just been like, I'll just show up and see what happens, you know? And it was surprisingly good. Um, I sold way more comics than I expected to. Not a ton, but a lot, given the fact I had this very minimal footprint and people basically had to stop and look at the covers to eat for me to even engage them. Like, yeah. you know, like it was, it was really easy for them to not even see me and walk by. Cause I was kind of nestled between like other things. Um, but, and like the first hour, nothing happened. I was like, Oh, this is going to be terrible. Terrible, 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 like nothing. But then after that, it was like, you know, little drips and drabs. And then uh, by the, it was about the afternoon, one guy came by and this is the main guy I want to shout out. I don't know his name. I never got it. I should have, cause I want to write a folk song about him. Um, he came by and he bought comics from all three of us, from Keith, from Scott and from me, all, every books we had, every book we had on offer. He's like, loaded up and he wanted all of them he wanted a stack he's like i'm here for indie comics like that's what i want I, i've read all the marvel stuff i've read all the dc stuff all the stuff is just anime and prints i want comics i want to get comics at a comic convention and that we was me too like, that's why i went there too i mean and that's what i did i i mean i went out and i bought a ton of indie comics i showed Wait. some of them in the video i did but gary yeah. was that scott no, it was not. It wasn't. He wasn't wearing a fake mustache. It was actually a different <laughs> person. And like, and this guy, we were all like, we want to kiss you on the mouth. Like, I mean, <laughs> this is fantastic. Like, this is what we've been wanting and not seeing so much the past few years. Yeah. And so we, so he cleaned us out. Every book you want, line them up. I want them. And then when I followed up with the guys for Sunday, they said they had two more people like that who came by and said, I want every book like whatever book you have and they get the pile. And not only that, one of the guys tipped each of them, which I've never even heard of, but they tipped each of the guys a $20 bill. Wow. Nice. So it was just sort of, and so it was like after that, for just my day experience there, but then after hearing their experience, I, I don't know how to explain it. Is it pent up comic demand? Is it the fact they made changes with the convention? I don't know what it was but I feel like I'm back in, you know, like, I feel like this is kind of what I was hoping. And I was also relieved to see so many people come up to our table and say, Oh, thank God. It's not more anime stuff. You know, like they really were relieved that it was something other than draw manga drawings of girls in schoolgirl outfits. You know, like, I mean, it's actually like, Oh, stories. Oh, indie comics. Oh, not, not fan art. You know, like, I mean, it's like someone doing something, you know. Yeah. So I was surprised, you know. I was really surprised, and I kind of 180 where, like, a year ago, I would have told you, like, no, nah, I'm not doing the con thing anymore. And today, so, you know, I've been talking, and we'll get more into this later, I'm sure, but I've been talking to Scott and Keith, and we're like, let's all go in on two tables next year, you know, and, like, we'll divide it up into thirds, and we'll share the, you know, the fees, and, like, but I'm, I'm back in. So, well, like if you guys make that three, I'll I'll join you too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. That's that's cool. I I also really want to reiterate um, how much of an impact uh, people out there who read indie comics actually make to creators too. It's like the act of like buying a book may seem like a small thing, 
it's not like it, you could literally be making a creator's day and like doing something like buying every indie book at a table. Um, that's amazing. There needs to be more of that kind of thing. Right. We're all comics fans. Comics all start somewhere. Um, cartoonists all start somewhere too. And it's like, that's just a really, I don't know. That's, that's I've definitely had moments like that too. I think it was the first day of LA comic con where it was a little slow for the first hour. Yeah. And then Chris Cowick, you and I boost together and this guy came by and he was just like, oh, I want that, that. Like, so we just start stacking yeah. stuff and he's just dropping like hundreds of dollars. <laughs> like right. just and at our table, just out. like instantly, you know, and he's just yeah. like, I just like indie stuff. And like, I think he even got redirected to some of our more like pop culture stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, no, no. I want the comics. Stuff. Right. I want the well, and stuff. And give some credit to Keith Foster in particular. Yeah. So like my book, like it's a little hard to pitch and I have to admit, I don't love pitching and I don't think I'm great at it. So like, that's never been my strong suit. And it's yeah. always a little tricky for me. Sometimes people like, they only hear a little bit about it and they're like, yep, I want that, you know, but it's, it's rare. Usually I have to, they need to look at it a little bit or I need to talk to them a little bit. Keith, on the other hand, he's got a very easy concept where he's like, uh, it's like basically Godzilla meets Lovecraft. It's like a, a kaiju Lovecraftian thing. And it's there I saw multiple times. He had, a, of all the three of us, he had the most phenomenal weekend. Like yeah. he, it was crazy. But like it showed the power of a good pitch and a good concept with a lot of broad appeal where like some people would walk up and they're like, what's this? And he's like, you know, it's like big monsters. It's like a Lovecraftian big monster thing. If you're into Godzilla, you'll like it. And they're like, I like it. And they would just buy a book. They wouldn't even open it. They'd be yeah. like, sure. You know, like they were just into, they bought into the concept and they didn't even have, that's all they needed to hear. Yeah. And that happened occasionally with me where I would, I used uh, Scott's thing liberally where I was like, Quentin Tarantino did an X-Files, you know, and uh, people would be like, all right, that sounds awesome. You know, like you can, if you find the right person, they don't even need to look, they don't even need to talk about it. They're kind of like, yep, ring me up. Yeah. Yeah. And those, and, and like, ah, it's just so, uh, so cool. Um, uh, okay. So Scott, um, like what all were you kind of like Gary talked a little bit about like his table and stuff. Um, you were a guest for surprise comics. Like what did your, uh, space look like? So basically I pretty much had a full table. I didn't know I was going to have a full table when I got there. Cause at nice. first I was trying to, cause I didn't know if I was going to at times, I was going to be next to one of the other artists if we were going to double up. So I was like doing half this table. And then later I just realized, oh, I, I, I can just take over this whole table. So basically they had, you know, they had the covers that I, you know, the, I did a cover for ice cream man and I did a cover for Betty and Veronica. They had those there. Um, some of them with remarks, some without, and some of them, you know, so they had those displayed. And then I had previous to that, I had done just, about five different sketch covers just to bring with me. So I had those on display and everything. And then I had some of them were up and then some of them were on the table um, out of reach because it, you have to worry about theft and stuff, especially with high price items and things like that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so just either high enough where they don't just pick it up and like walk off because people would be like, Oh, that's cool. And then we, when you turn your head, they like take off with it. But anyway, so I had that that stuff on my table, and then I just had an area to do area to do my sketching and everything. Um, so yeah, and I was just doing sketches and stuff like that. And uh, uh, for me, it was if I if like kind of like I think Gary may have kind of had the the better experience when it came to sales. I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely, because I had higher price items, you know, I only had to do a couple commissions and, you know, that was, it was giving me money to spend on the floor and support other indie comic artists and stuff like that. Um, and also the other thing is the, the stuff that I was drawing, like if I wasn't taking a commission, I was just drawing a sketch cover and I can, turn around and I can give that like right now they're at the comic store and they'll eventually they'll sell if it takes like I I just went in to get like I had to pick up some money from one of the commissions because I hadn't finished it yet because the guy was only there one day so he had to go back in so I went there to get the money for that and I had already sold another one of them um, and so if I do an appearance at the store or whatever I'll eventually I'll, I'll make money off of those so it wasn't like wasted time wasted even though you know all that time that I spent drawing I eventually will uh, get paid for that 
So, um, so that part of the experience was good. I didn't have like in contrast. So Eric Henson, who we've had on the show, awesome artist, um, uh, you know, author of Eden and artist of Eden and everything. Um, he, he does crazy, you know, sketches and stuff. And he's got a lot, he did, he's done a lot more of those sketch or those, uh, variant covers than I yeah. have. So, you know, he was over, he was an invited guest. So he was out like with the kind of artist alley, but off where the, you know, with some of the bigger names and stuff. And he had to keep sending a runner back to get more books because he kept running out. And he was so he was doing really well over in that area. And Matt, the comic store owner, he kept apologizing, saying, well, yeah, I mean, I think I think if you were over there, you'd be making more money. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's cool. It's fine. So if I wanted to, you know, if I yeah. if I really wanted to to do that, I I, I kind of know how I would do it. But that wasn't really my that wasn't what I was there for. Yeah, that wasn't your objective. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So but I did. I, I definitely got the same vibe. It was we were just kind of in a weird space because we we're in this this almost like this huge thoroughfare. It was like twice yeah. as big as any of the other aisles. But right. people, because of that, it just seemed like people were just kind of walking by and they weren't really expecting that wasn't really the place for an artist that was doing sketches. You know, that was they were there. Too. Like, I think yeah. Artist Alley. If, yeah. It's, so it's not because I went and visited him at the Surprise Comics booth and it's not where you'd expect to find like what he was offering. You yeah. know, you'd expect to see that over in the Artist Alley area. So I'm sure that had a. Yeah. But like, you know, if I if I decided that I wanted to go back and just do commissions yeah. or just sell my comic, which that's something I've never really done is just focus just on my comic. I um, encourage I could, you guys to do yeah, it. Yeah, it's also kind of weird because and, and this didn't happen. I was kind of worried that it would. I was worried that I have have people because I did have some loyal customers, you know, that would keep coming back at my booth and just loved it was very, you know, because it was very specific. The mad science, yeah. all that stuff. So, but I did have really loyal people that would just go and drop hundreds of dollars and, yeah. and, you know, and, and just look forward to seeing me every year. So I was afraid they come back and just see me there and like, Oh, where's all your other cool stuff. And I, I would kind of, if I just went selling my comic, I kind of feel like, like, yeah, I used to be, I used to have this big giant thing and now I'm just doing this, but you know, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'll, if I will go back, I, I, it would probably just depend on the circumstance. I don't think surprise is going to go back because for one, they just came, they didn't do very well, uh, by the oh. way, because the, 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 in the past, in the past, they, I mean, they've done a lot of stuff with like minifigures and Legos and stuff like that and other stuff that they sell in the store. So in the past they did really well, but you know, he, Matt, the owner, he didn't want to deal with all that stuff because it's, it's more complicated, you know, and they didn't have, any back issues basically all they did was they brought their high dollar slab comics you know the stuff that goes for thousand dollars or like stuff yeah. like that so, that's not so gonna move he, as much just selling one move, of those yeah. things you yeah, know was a good deal for them and they did but they didn't sell a lot you know they were selling the, actually they were one thing they were selling a lot of were just the blanks like what the, what i was doing the sketch, sketch covers on so a lot of artists came by and get blanks or whatever um yeah. so they, they sold quite a few of those and they sold they did sell some of the the um, exclusive covers, but they had one exclusive cover that Eric did for um, for Twig, which is the new Scotty Young book. It looked awesome, and and I don't, you know, in the past they uh, this is one thing that I didn't like that they were. Uh, overall, I think they did a great job with some of the changes they made. I don't know if if those changes were just necessity because they weren't expecting as big of a crowd. Yeah. Like condensing everything on the same floor, which I thought was a smart decision. I talked so about some good. of this in my video. They didn't have like Cox Communications and like like Primavera College and all that stuff on the show floor. They were kind of outside, which I don't mind. Like if you're on your way yeah. to the panels or if you're out before you get into the hall. But I just don't think that's kind of stuff belongs in no on the showroom floor. So, so basically they had, they had the celebrities, they had the Lego builders, they had the cosplayers, the, you know, 501st, all that, all that kind of stuff, uh, all the groups, Ghostbusters groups and, and all that kind of stuff all on the main floor. And then the only thing really they had up on the other floor was um, I think the gaming and, and the panels, which I, I think that makes that kind of stuff makes sense to have separate. 
Yeah. But um, once when they started moving like the cosplayers and the celebrities to the other floor, some people that's all they go there for, and so they spent you know a lot of time, and they didn't have as many celebrities, which I think helps. You know, it's kind of like I don't think it's the same audience. So because they didn't have as many celebrities or higher profile celebrities, I think that also gave people weren't spending as much money on those because that's that's pretty high ticket items. And sometimes people go with only a certain amount of things, you know, yeah. um, but we, the, sorry, we got a few questions in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I yeah. think we should kind of hit some of them. Yeah. So let me back up. Okay. First, uh, Jim Lujan and Gary, please feel, feel these uh, first too, if you can. Um, if online sales were really brisk, do cons hold nearly as much value? What's your thought? Mm, not for me. I mean, well, th it depends what kind of value you're looking for. If you're looking yeah. for yeah. hanging out with creators, if you're looking for meeting people, if you're looking for getting, you know, your work out in front of people, possibly um, there's value in that. I mean, and if, I mean, if you're doing really well at a con, if you're selling prints and things like that, and even that I will say, I noticed a lot of people doing prints had really upped their game before it was just like, yeah almost like to the level where you go to Kinko and get 11 by 17 print and you're selling those. I mean, I think those days are kind of, if you're, if you're able to do that, um, you're, I, it, it, that would surprise me because I mean, people are taking prints to the next level. I mean, oversized prints, prints on canvas, prints on linen, prints, lenticular animated prints, yeah. um, prints on metal just, and, and the, I think the level of artwork, um, I think it, 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 it's been elevated too. So, um, that was one thing that did kind of impress me, even though I don't buy prints cause I don't have room for them and everything. And I mean, they're cool to look at. I love looking at those prints, but it just, that's not my thing. But if you are going to go sell prints, I really think you need to be up, up in your game because I mean, there's just some fantastic artists before, you know, not just, you know, people that people that have put in, a, if they're doing fan art that can put an original spin on it. Like I don't, I, I'm not, I wasn't really impressed by this, but I mean, there was, there was one guy that was selling prints of just stitch doing as dressed up as every single thing he did was like Lilo and stitch stitch, but dressed as a different hero. Uh, and another person had that famous scene from the lion King where they're holding up Simba, but different characters holding up other characters, like every single print. So, I mean, that kind of stuff, I mean, it, it, it makes sense because you're kind of putting the spin on it. And it, I, I, the one thing I always tell people, I think you'll do better if you have one specific thing in, instead of diversifying, which I used to do, which was part of my problem because you have to boil everything down to something easy for people to, to digest because okay. otherwise it's like, there's just so much sensory overload. It's like, what is this? Oh, this is too much. And then it's just like, but if you can like have one particular style or one theme, then that's probably as far as sales go. I mean, I would get totally bored doing that and, and probably, you know, uh, yeah. And I wouldn't have much fun doing that, but that kind of stuff works. So, so I guess in a roundabout way to answer Jim's question. Um, yeah. I mean, I think for me, I, the amount of time I was putting into the shows, if I focused a little more on that, on building like digital products and things like that, um, that that made more sense to me, you know, the, you know, and I'm really, I've really contrary to, to Gary, <laughs> I've really made this shift like to more digital stuff because <laughs> I don't have to ship it. I don't have to, you know, if I get a sale now, and again, I've said this before, I don't want to discourage anyone from buying physical stuff because me personally, I like physical stuff, but I realize the one thing I think I would, you know, Gary's going to do what Gary's going to do, but you have to, you have to realize that you are not your own target audience. Yeah. Just because you might not like the way something is, doesn't mean other people won't. You so know, Scott, I know there's a market that out would there. Be true. If Gary weren't completely 100% <laughs> correct about this. <laughs> yeah. You know okay. what? I was just about to say, like, it's funny that I like my, by reputation, I've become the anti digital media person. And you know what? I'm totally fine with it. Oh, oh, I know you are. That's like no, and I oh, I, no, I, I definitely admire that. And maybe it's just because I'm more of a. I don't think know. you should. I think you actually, whether you intended to or not, you hit the nail on the head. Like I think yeah. I have trouble separating the fact that because I'm not interested in this, I'm not going to sell it, which yeah. is kind of a you know like I think that's a very 
shaky position to hold. <laughs> you know, yeah. there are people who want to con like only consume things digitally. They don't want to find another long box for books. Like they like to hang things on the wall, whatever. The fact that I'm not into any of that maybe isn't a good enough reason not to do it. But I think, and it's probably come up in other videos before, I am very like um, authenticity and passion motivated. And if yeah. I don't care about it, I can't be bothered. You right. know, and that's, yeah. that's not necessarily a good thing. You know, that can be a, a problem. So yeah, I have, I mean, I have I a question. Love, I have a question, yeah. Gary. Do you prefer Luddite or Troglodyte? <laughs> <laughs> I do prefer Luddite. If I have okay. to pick between right. one of those two. Yeah. That's, all right. Man, that's good. This yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to, I don't want to, I don't want to misterm you. So I just thank you. I appreciate that. that. Yeah. yeah, just making sure. All right. I should. Can we update my thing handle? Can it be Gary Hodges Luddite, please? I, I believe we can. Let's. Okay. Let's see yeah. If I can uh, maybe that. I have the ability to do that. But to answer yeah, this question, I, I, I could be wrong. My impression is that these are two distinct ones. I feel like the con audience is a little like the people I'm selling to digital, not uh, like online are a little different from the people I'm selling to regularly at cons. And I, I, if I was convinced I could overlap them, I probably would just feel like comms is a, cons are a lot of work for not a lot of payoff. Um, but I just, the people I'm meeting there, especially the ones I meet every year I go, like the ones I see, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember you. I remember you. Like I had a handful of people come up to me, two or three people who are like, I don't know if you remember me. And I was like, yeah, I, re I re there's something about it. Now, something, I think like taking cash from someone at a con for one book has a bigger psychological impact on you than taking a hundred dollars over, you know, like a week through online sales. I, you know, it's just, there's something more real about that and something that feels better. Um, but like I said, I think it's, I think it's different crowds. I, I, I think as long as you can find a way to not lose money at a con, it's probably worth it to do both. Yeah. I, I, I have an opinion on it just from like the one con I've done so far. And I'm really going to be curious because um, everything that Scott was just saying about like cons and Gary was describing like sort of cons having become before 2019. <clears throat> and some of that still remains where it's like most cons you go to, you will notice that it's like a lot of pop culture prints that have like a, cute twist on it like a lot of the stuff that used to sell on like t fury that's your comic con gold like that's the stuff that's going to sell at a convention um i have heard total opposite stories from tcaf that's like supposedly the one convention from what i've heard for about over a decade i'm going to be very disappointed if this isn't the case where people literally go there for books and that's it yeah. and they even are really picky about like who gets in in the sense of like, they have to be people who make books. Um, I didn't even know about the recent drama there um, until <laughs> I was That's doing a live about. stream and then somebody was like, oh, you're doing TCAP. And I'm like, oh no, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> but the drama had a lot to do with that where it was like right. they had invited a special guest who was not primarily a cartoonist and um, they were like an NFT artist or something. And oh, but even, everyone but even, flipped. But even, um, worse, yeah. but even worse than that, Josh, uh, she was an NFT artist who went out of her way to trace over indie comic book characters. And Not just any, as... too. Jamie Hewlett, which is like a... Right. So she's doing Tank Girl and other types yeah. of... And it's like... Wow. So it wasn't... It wasn't... I mean, some of it was the NFT stuff, but a lot yeah. of it was... Are you kidding me? You're, you're specifically choosing somebody who's plagiarizing indie comics? Wow. But the key thing... The, the key thing that, like, made it a big deal at... TCAF more than it would be at any other convention was specifically the fact that like TCAF is known as a as a book convention. So it's like if you're a person who's an artist, I mean obviously the other stuff <laughs> piled on top of the other fact, but that's the thing that kind of fired people up at first was just like the hell's this person doing? They're not a cartoonist. And it's it's and I didn't feel that. I like I had missed the whole um, rage thing. But uh, but by the time I kind of caught up on it, I, I understood it because like that's one of the things that's made me want to go to that con for so long. So I'll have to report to you guys whether it's uh, like the exquisite indie 
dream that I've heard. I will say, like, I used to hear things like that about Ape back in the day. Yeah. And I went, and it was exactly that, um, where you had a bunch of people coming up to your booth and being like, I have never heard of you. I have never heard of this book, and I'm so excited. And you're like, what? Like, it's it's the opposite of, like, the usual thing of, like, well, you know, I'm, okay, cool. Well, I'm going to go get the uh, Incredible Holtz autograph or whatever. Um, well, so, it goes back to your original uh one of your original points about how people don't realize how big an impact yeah. something like that can make on an indie creator. Like I had really gone into this with my enthusiasm for content yeah. empty. Yeah. And it was really like an encounter, basically that encounter alone that was like, all right, I'll try again, you know, like just one. Yeah. And I think, um, I think that uh, just to answer Jim's thing too, it's like, to me, I think what I've become convinced of is like, I, I think that you can go to a con and clean up and make money, but I think there's two objectives. And I think, I, I think one objective could be to make tons of money. Number two could be to promote and sell books. Um, and now promoting and selling books doesn't necessarily mean making a ton of money at that moment, but that's just more like that long game marketing. And I think for that, I, I think like even like I was mentioning TCAP is like an exception. Like that might be the dream convention where you're just going there and people really want your book. But I think outside of that, I do think there's a reason big publishers go to those things. And it's not just to clean up at the con. It's to make all those connections, to get all the press, because there's press everywhere at cons. Um, and quite frequently when you booth at a con, you're going to have somebody from like a local newspaper or whatever, like stop by your booth. Um, there's all sorts of weird connections that happen at conventions that are hard to replicate elsewhere. So that's, to me, I would say like, for me, the money thing, like ideally I don't want to lose a lot, a lot of money, uh, cause that's a bad business, but for, uh, you know, to me, I, I think like cons have a bigger objective than just sales. Like it's more marketing objectives. Yeah. Like the same reason people do spend a lot of money at NAM, right? Like in, in music investing. Where it's like you're not going there to sell all the Fender guitars that day, but Fender has a huge presence there because that starts setting the trend and the news cycle and, you know, hits those key buyers that are then going to like write about it and talk about it. So that's my take on it. I don't know. Well, and this, I, this is something I would, I don't know if it's necessarily true, but I would like to believe it. And I saw tiny, tiny bits of evidence that maybe would suggest it, but I, I, I I can't say anything definitively, but I do think especially with the the ocean of content available online, uh, actually having a booth with a brand, with merch on a table does seem to lend an air of like legitimacy and ability that could separate you like, from someone totally anonymous online. Yeah. Do Scott, think Scott, I'm sorry, I have to mention, like, there's like these creaks happening. Yeah, there's something like, like, like that. Like, the ice. creak is the chair, and the okay. AC's back on again. So, okay, okay. And I can I can count the ice cubes in your drink. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Gary was talking, and then you just hear this ice cubes just go through the uh, <laughs> glacier collapse. Yeah. Sorry. Anyhow. Um, <laughs> I think it adds some kind of like legitimacy to you as a creator and helps you. It sets you apart a little bit. Again, I can't say that definitively, but I, I had that impression. And the reason I was started thinking about this was Keith, who I was immediately next to at the, the way we were arranged. Uh, so he does the comic Kadoja. It's his, his big monster comic. He got a couple of that monster 3D printed about this big like and they look like little vinyl figures on the table and he got like a really cool box made for them and it looks like something you would buy in a store like it looks like a i mean it is a legit thing he made it but it looks like a legit thing you could buy so like you know it's like oh this must be something you yeah. know and i couldn't tell it was he sold zero of them but he had tons of people stopping to pick it up and look at it and then buy something else 
you know? So, and we were trying to analyze this like in between sales. It was like, no one wants to buy this thing, but it does get them like, it gets their attention and then they spend time at the table and they end up sometimes buying other things. And my theory was it makes you look legit. Like something's happening here. He's got an action figure for his thing. You know, like there's something, there's something here. I think maybe a simpler level, just being at the con is something yeah. like that, as opposed to just having a storefront online. You know, it just shows that you're a person and you're making things happen somehow. You must, because you've got a booth with a sign, you know? Yeah. And I think those one-on-one -on -one interactions like really go a long way um, because I, I do think it's hard to make connections at cons sometimes, but I think the kinds of people who like connect you at a con tend to be very like lasting fan bases. It's very strange. Yes. Um, and, and it's hard to kind of generate that same loyalty online, although you still can. It's just, there is a thing with like in person, we've talked about that, about meetups and stuff too. Yeah. Um, uh, Paul Pate wanted to say, uh, sorry, I missed all of the talk uh, about Corey's dome. This is my first time seeing it. I like it. So Corey, do you mm -hmm. have any comments on that? Yeah, we didn't talk about it. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, well, said, well said. So, uh, I like no, also, no. I noticed my update here on my yeah. deck. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted it to be accurate. No, I, I, checked, I, I checked beforehand. Uh, I don't know. Do you ever just feel like your hair just gets really hot? Yes. Any reference there? No, Tell me about okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, no I, yeah, sometimes I just uh, shave my head because it's, I, I work at a place with a, with a dress code that includes length of hair and uh sometimes i'm like you know give me a couple months and i'll have gary's length of hair and i'll be in trouble and this is not outside of uh the realm of whatever because i'm just another bald white guy so this is actually the short i actually got it chopped <laughs> minimally uh not long ago so now it's only shoulder length yeah um, I mean, I, I, this semester I have several like 7 a.m. meetings, which I think is just evil. And, uh, and if I, if I have hair, I can't like shower the night before, mm -hmm. but if I don't have hair, I can shower the night before and then I'm, and then I can just wake up and roll out of bed and no one can tell. So I like probably just do this. I don't know. I do this every couple of years. Just... Yeah. I didn't say anything just cause I, I know you've done that before. So I wasn't like, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's not like a really weird one for me either because I think uh, up until like this year, I've I, my hair tends to go from like somewhat unmanageable to like just shaved down. Um, yeah, yeah. And also you look kind of red like a member of Minor Threat or something, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, all right, so... Uh, I did Frank, want to respond oh, to one of Jim's thing. He was asking about COVID-Con. Uh, as yeah, a matter right. of fact, I'll be doing this right when we get off the air. Uh, I have no symptoms... But you're at a con and you're talking to people all day and this yeah. is five days out. So I'll be uh, trying that out just to make sure I'm okay. Yeah, I was going to ask actually um, regarding that, you know, in this day and age, like obviously we have some other concerns than just, you know, a typical con. Although honestly, thinking about that, it kind of makes sense that maybe that should be something of concern at all cons. Like, because generally every cartoonist I know tends to have that moment of like, you do your three days at a con and then, you know, nine out of 10 cartoonists, you know, who did the con have like a sick week. <laughs> on, on crud is a thing. Con yeah. crud is 100% a thing. Yeah. So how did you guys feel about that? Like, did they do a pretty good job with it? Like, how is it? Like, how did they go about that? Was there any sort of Terrible. testing? Well, yeah, I, mean, I didn't no. see any protocols. At Nothing. All. No, <laughs> I, I, we had masks. Makes me so nervous. And and I would wear a mask if I ventured away from the table. We felt fairly, we had all been tested recently, so we knew the three of us were. Yeah. Wrong. And when you're at your table, like you feel like you have a little bit of distance from people walking by and you're not st spending an extended period of time with any one person. So like you're not, but you're shaking some hands and sometimes a customer will engage and talk at you for a while. But I saw very few masks um I, it was honestly i think it was the most it was the least safe thing i've done in this whole covid era like yeah. I, I i was a little conflicted about it i have to admit 
Yeah, I mean, I felt conflicted before the one I did. Uh, the last one I did was L.A. Comic Con, but they, that was a little bit earlier before, like, a lot of the um, mandates and stuff kind of loosened up. And so they had, like, a fairly, like, regimented, like, thing where they were, you know, making sure people were vaccinated at the door, all of that. I'm a little nervous for that reason about TCAF, um, you know, because like, like I, I hope there's some kind of thing. Like I, I don't want it to be like overly, you know, crazy for people. But at the same time, I also really don't want to get COVID. So, no. like, um, you know, I, I feel like a little bit of uh, that. That's kind of um, I don't know how to feel about that. I guess I feel mixed about that. Like I guess it's good yeah. that we're kind of in a scenario. We're getting towards an era where that's less and less necessary. But still, it feels like yeah. maybe. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe the maybe numbers, I mean, I do kind of regularly look at the numbers and, and yeah. they, they're, they're not bad right now, but they're kind of creeping up again. Yeah. Right. So I thought like, well, this will be, this will be the test, I guess. But um, yeah, we'll see. Like, I, I think I'm fine. And cool. I think it would, and I, again, just the way it was set up, I think I would be uh, more uncomfortable if I was an attendee. Like if yeah. you're behind a table and got a little space, you know. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. I live in I live in Idaho. That's it's so <laughs> <That's I, it. laughs> it's like 14 story. people there, right? 15. Yeah, I got I got COVID. I got COVID about a week after I went to California, the only time I've left the state in the last two years. Yeah. Um so so yeah. Um anyway, I don't know. To, yeah, to I, the, I think I think, um, I don't know. I just, I, I kind of think maybe, maybe we're not out of the woods yet on that. Maybe I'm being overly paranoid. I don't know, but I, uh, I'm nervous about that. I, so I was, you... I was as cautious as I could be given the fact I was going to a place with like, you know, whatever, 50,000 people showing up. Like I, I was doing the sanitizer when I'd get a yeah. chance. I would wear the mask if I ventured away from the table, you know, like stuff like that. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think, uh, uh, well, anyhow, whatever. Uh, I don't want to belabor, belabor that too much. It, was there anything on the COVID front other than that that you guys wanted to talk about? No, I just, uh, I, I got my booster before I went, but that was, I didn't I didn't wear a mask or anything. So, um, and yeah. I, I shouldn't say this because I kind of had that same feeling before I got COVID that I just usually don't get sick because I I don't think I've ever been, a, been to a con, con and got con crud. So, and I didn't this time knock on glass and there would, would. Yeah. so, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I would say like, that's, that's probably good, good advice, but I like just get, get your boosters, make sure you yeah, get your you're yeah. speed and stuff. Um, I, Cause it's like at the end of the day, like the last thing you want to do to do to promote a comic is like get deathly sick you know so i wish um, i could get i'm all boosted i wish i'm just a few years shy of being able to get that next booster and i, I know i i keep joking that i i want to just like every time i've had like a vaccination i'm just like just give me like 10 i don't yeah care. yeah just 10 years. <laughs> like, yeah. um that's that's crazy. I, I so okay so that was interesting let's see um We've got, I felt like there was more in the chats and I've been trying to kind of keep lot. up the with chat the chats. pretty active, especially with Frank. And oh Jim. my gosh. Jim, Jim. Han and I, I, Jim, I fought so hard not to say that joke as everyone was saying Prince and Prince and Prince. And I think yeah. Scott was saying something like, I was, it's going to be really hard to sell Prince. And I was going to be like, unless it's purple rain and then you're going to be making lots of money. I was and thinking I was holding the same off. thing. I was thinking yeah. about, yeah. Well, and, we uh, had with the con the guys I went to the con with. We were debating here. Now we can open the floor. Okay, guys, the bigger artist, the more the, whatever metric you want, Prince or Michael Jackson. Like bigger, bigger. That's for you to decide. I say, you just oh, I, th I thought we were answering it. Oh. Like physically, you are. You are. Oh, answer, okay. Uh... So I would say, as a career as a whole, definitely Prince, but off the wall. Thriller, mm, more off the wall. Hey, even Jackson Five, if you put that in there, I, I'd say Michael Jackson. But Prince, I think, 
I mean, I, I just think things dropped off after Thriller for Michael Jackson for me personally. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prince I, is definitely more consistent. I think that uh, Bad is still one of the best albums ever made, uh-huh. uh, like okay. probably of all time. But um, but uh, I can't listen to it. So I will vote for Prince because I've actually gotten to that weird point of like, I have trouble listening to Michael Jackson. Really? Um, for like, yeah. for because of lifestyle concerns? It was just the last, like, you know, I again, like I grew up, I liked Captain EO. I even have a Captain EO shirt because I just thought it was hilarious and awesome. Exactly. The rainbow. Um, and uh, I, I just thought Michael Jackson was the bee's knees. I, I still think incredible musician i agree with scott like kind of fell off in his latter years i don't think he did a lot of good music later on but that core michael jackson like that's a hard thing to top for anyone mm-hmm. but still the thing i like about prince is like i don't have ethical problems listening to prince right <laughs> you know so i'm gonna give it to prince just because hey good on you not like doing too much creepy stuff. I mean, other than apparently, according to Kevin Smith, like wearing sneakers, which is really strange to think of Prince wearing sneakers. So that is strange. Okay. What do you think? Me or Corey? Corey. Corey, weigh in. Prince I, Michael Jackson. I have almost no opinion. Um, <laughs> I somehow I, could have guessed that. Yeah, I, I was somehow say that too. figured I, like both. He's not gonna, he's not gonna, he's not gonna bite on this. So no. boring. Um, <laughs> I mean, Thriller was cool. I did like Thriller. Captain EO was cool. But also, what was I, like six or eight or something? You know, everything was cool back then. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's cool that Prince was on uh, New Girl on that one episode. I guess that's all right. I, I have – those are my only three touch points on, on those artists. They're both weird, freaky kind of just <laughs> – people off in the corners of reality uh, yeah sometimes cool. weird and freaky is cool and then sometimes it's uh, so weird. bad i can't listen to the albums anymore right. you know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, this makes me i feel like this is a moral dilemma weird and freaky. I, I feel like i feel like there are several sliders you know you go left to right okay and and that's like the weird freaky to like you know like fits into society and then you go up to down and that's like the moral you know, issue and and left to right, they're about the same, but then up to down, they're they're on different ends of the spectrum. I don't know unless unless forty seven women are going to come out about Prince at some point in time and pull. It's you know, it's always, I, who knows? Yeah, I I don't in, any celebrity. I I I wonder if it's even possible to keep your sanity when you get to the point where you are just surrounded by people that just tell you that. Every, that your farts don't stink and everything that you, you do, do is just anything blessed. you want. Yeah, you have. Yeah, like, how do you how do you not just go completely insane? Yeah. I you know so yeah I don't know but musically I probably couldn't name two songs on either artist. Here more really what that yeah, Jackson that's Five cool. come on man come on that's, oh. that's the I, you know my what? dad my dad was I, a straight up punk rocker. And my mom listened only to the Beatles and Jim Croce, and that was it. And so for the first she had 12... Taste. She had, like, that's, right. yeah. Did but she listen to Paul thing... McCartney's like terrible solo career stuff? Because like yeah. there, there's some Michael Jackson there. I, Wait, no, are, you I, including yeah. wing, are you including Wings as solo career? You don't like Wings? Not a fan of Wings. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. No. Yeah, I mean, the hot takes are dropping. I had no yeah. idea this was going to... No, just I mean, it, I, the, until, the I, until I until I are going to get uh, online, the, like it's just. I think what? I was. I think two there was four Jackson songs. What wings is trash? What I could probably I could probably name two Michael Jackson songs. Of course you could, and not only that, I but but, but I will say I that I played some. You would know them. You would. Oh, know. oh sure, yeah. No, I'm not yeah. saying I haven't yeah. been that I've that I've been like not been influenced by them in in the zeitgeist, but I like kind of like Taylor Swift. I'm sure I'm aware of her songs. But I find her horrifically boring, and I don't know what any of them are called. Okay, uh, that, that we can I can't, I can't believe we're comparing Taylor Swift. Yes, she is an inc- wait, 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 wait! Hold on, I will... Taylor Swift here. 
Taylor I Swift like... has written better songs than any song Wings ever wrote. What? <laughs> what? No, come on. Yeah, yeah, I, will say, say, I will say this. I will say this about. I'll say this about Taylor Swift. Uh, even though her music might be the most milk toast, lame, washed out, boring garbage, mm-hmm. she has tapped into a zeitgeist of generations who love milk toast, washed out, boring garbage so much that she's able to tell the music industry to f off, and she can do whatever she wants. That's you know pretty cool. Yeah, you know, I agree my, with that. Here's my counterpoint. Tapping into the zeitgeist is overrated. You know who else did? Adolf Hitler. So, like, I don't, like, I, no. Oh, that's my gosh. You saying, guys, that spelled I'm out saying, the actual end of this discussion because we made the internet <laughs> fallacy. I just want to, I just want to say, I Thank just want to say. But I'm glad Eddie, it wasn't me because I was about there. <laughs> I was that close. <laughs> who was it? Who was it that was, like, a major artist that tried to tell Spotify? It was Neil Young. Neil yeah, Young yeah. tries to tell Spotify, well, I'm going to take my music. And they're like, all right, see you later. Taylor Swift was like, I'm going to take my music. And like five seconds later, they're like, we're sorry, Ms. Swift. Right. Whatever you want. I'm so sure. sorry. Neil Young? Oh, you it's know what, nothing? though? Okay, so this is you definitely see, back in Gary's point. Because... Bring you the nickel back. <laughs> nice. I haven't yet. Um, but I, I was going to say that fact alone backs Gary's point that like clout doesn't necessarily make it like a great that guy thing means nothing. It means because nothing. of the fact that like Neil Young should be a bigger zeitgeist deal oh, than yeah. Taylor Swift. I don't think I, anyone oh, No, I am the first person to say that what is popular is usually the most trite cliche garbage out there and I hate it. And I so support just, indie comics, you guys. I had yeah. no idea this topic would pay such dividends. I, I really shaved, did not. I shaved my head to come like, hard for this to topic. go, like you know, I'll That's just true. So, uh, well, look, I recognize Michael Jackson's contribution to pop culture and that it was many times what Prince's was. I'm a snob for people who can actually play instruments, so I'm gonna go with Prince. Yeah, that's okay. The very good case for Prince. Yes. Easily one of the best guitarists who ever and lived. Play every he's single actually, instrument. Yeah, is. he's a genius. Yeah. He's literally a yeah. like when instrumentally a, a genius. So you guys really enjoy when he sings into the megaphone. Have you guys ever um, <laughs> ever are bored and want to see Prince just tear it up? Like, and this will give you mad respect for Prince regardless of like whether you like Prince or not. Uh, there's a rock and roll, I think it's rock and roll hall of fame where they're doing a uh, tribute to well, my guitar gently weeps. And there's like all the killer shreddy guitarists on stage. It's very corny, right? Yeah. But there's this part where it's supposed to go to the lead and it's really obvious that like one of the like studio musicians who's like supposed to be playing just got carried away and like accidentally took, prince's lead section Ooh. and it was like this big faux pas and you can kind of see it like causing this kind of like oh no oh and like prince <laughs> just this is prince though this is how good of a guitarist and performer he was he just kind of chilled back let the guy shred and then came in like at a point where there's not even a space for a lead in the song and proceeded to shred on guitar so well that it pretty much just buried every guitarist on stage. There you go. Um, and also just kind of shrugged it off afterwards and was like, and I got a weird custom guitar. Yeah, that's right. So that's there Prince uh, crazy. Also, um, Purple Ron, I'd say, is is another <laughs> testament to Prince's yeah, power. I, I, wanted, I wanted to come in and explain to Gary, I think I probably recognize most of the songs I recognize from those artists yes. because of parody artists that I prefer. Oh wow! Like Weird Al's, like oh Bob. no! Please don't! Please, please! Weird Al's fat. Someone starts saying a, it's a the Weird Al version of anything is better than the original. I'm walk. I'm shutting my camera off, and that's that's it. I'm going back. To- <laughs> I'm telling. <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> Weird Al is a genius. Weird. I concur with. Oh Gary no, that. Gary! Come oh, okay. Okay. Well, Gary. I'm sorry. I, can't, I had to kick <laughs> Gary out for the effect. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye, <laughs> um, whatever. I'm out of here. No, um, no. What Weird was this Al topic? Is again? I love Weird Al. Like, yeah, Weird, I'm no shade toward Weird Al. But like, if you want to say "Eat It" is better than "Beat It," get the hell out of here, man! Like, what are you talking about? That's crazy talk. Have you? Okay, I, have you been to a Have you been to a Weird Al concert? No. 
No, and it shouldn't matter. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fan checking you here. Okay. Not, I hope this isn't like a weird rhetorical angle. Like, but no, 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 no. <laughs> all, all you guys, no. you guys, wait a minute, wait a minute. The debate topic here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. To see Weird Al in concert is really to see like the the entire artist because his shows are some of the most incredible concerts. Like it, it's corny and cheesy and funny and yeah. goofy, but they are incredible. And and I am a sh- I am shocked at how quickly they're. I mean, he gets into the fat suit with the fat suit face thing, like in yeah. between songs. Well, like one of his. One of his, like, well, John Bermuda Shorts is, like, doing a little thing on the drums for, like, 15 seconds. It's crazy. He's it's a very talented guy. And yeah. look, I would probably rewatch UHF tonight. Like, I thought yeah. that movie was hilarious. But, right. yeah. You know. all, all I'm saying is the only reason that I have any connection to, <laughs> the only reason that I have any connection <laughs> to most of those songs is because when I was 12, I loved Weird Al Yankovic yeah. and made my dad drive me hundreds of miles in any direction to go to the concerts yeah. whenever they came up. And I didn't really listen to the actual music because I was more into, you know, uh, the Ramones and Sex Pistols. And then eventually I moved into, you know, Megadeth and Pantera and Anthrax and stuff. And so it's like, I'm not listening to pop culture music to where I would even have any nostalgia or connection to it. I, I don't know. This is, I got it. Yeah, I, so I hate to. I, please, I'm not trying to derail further. But <laughs> no, no, no. I want to derail but, but, further. I'm has anyone watched this. the Sex Pistols? Who I think it's on a Hulu. The series about the Sex Pistols is there, is it good? Is it worth watching? Is there? I, I have think, not like, seen it yet. I'm kind of curious about it. But I will say, the more I've read about the Sex Pistols, the more I'm a fan of other punk bands from that era, and like not really like I. I don't get me wrong. Sex Pistols, Anarchy in the UK yeah. is like easily number one. Like, like if you're in junior high and you've never heard punk rock, yeah. it's a good like mind explosion, you know, where you're like, yeah, I'm an anarchist and the Antichrist. Like, I know this, like, this is all like intense and I don't even know what it means. It's amazing. And the Megadeth um, cover of that is pretty good too. Yeah. There's a lot of good Sex Pistols covers, but I will say the more I read about them, the more I'm like, Oh my gosh, like of all the punk bands, it Black Flag included, which are, they were like some, you know, Black Flag would get fist fights, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. But I will say the Sex Pistols just did not sound like good human beings at all. And I'm not <laughs> saying like I'm not saying like like Black Flag, they got rowdy, but I think they've got like hearts of gold and then maybe just right. a little too much drugs. Um and also you know, punk has a little bit of aggression to it. That's okay, but but uh, but the Sex Pistols, oh man, especially um, especially Sid Vicious. Um, oh not, yeah. yeah, not a good dude. Like threw glass bottles at like twelve year old girls' faces, <laughs> uh, breaking their noses like intentionally. And there's 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 documents of like the Dam and like other bands that were on tour with them. <laughs> How could you, why would you throw a bottle at the person's, like, they're they're the opening band, and they're like, why would you have done that? Like, it just, there was no point. And he's just like, yeah, punk rock. And they're like, no, <laughs> that's not, that's just right. kind of a dick move. <laughs> so right. anyhow, I'm just saying, um, I, it would be good fodder, though, for um, for a boy band documentary, for sure. Who, I can't remember the story. Do you remember the story? This recently came out. Somebody was recording in the same studio as Sid Vicious and they hated each other. I think it might've been Freddie Mercury. Have you heard this story? So, so Sid Vicious tries to, tries to like step up to Freddie Mercury, who you would think given the, the attitude of the two. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, that like Freddie Mercury like stood him down and he basically tucked his tail between his legs and ran away. Back down. Huh. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not surprised because there are also legendary stories of uh, the Clash kind of cutting it up with them, and let's just say the Clash walked out standing. So, because um, they were like, you know, from the dark side of London. <laughs> now, now I want to look that up. Oh my gosh, I love this. Um, 
Taylor Swift is our generation Sid Vicious, right? Actually, that's a fair point. Um, they're both they both have very similar um, yeah. backgrounds. They both yeah uh -huh. yeah they both were backed very heavily by producers and and although here's the difference: Taylor Swift wrote her music. Oh, look at that! Hey, I appreciate Jim Luhan shouting out in a in a kind of um, oblique way. Uh, Journey. Uh, oh yeah. Because he and I were both horrified that I think Corey said Journey was trash. So, like, we've talked about it since. I've been pretty sure. I, but... I mean, come on. <laughs> I, I will say. I will no. say. No, hold on. No, come on. No. Okay, I will say that the. Uh, hold on a second. Wait, wait, wait. I want to check it with Scott. Scott, the, Scott has the this gravity too much. The gravity <laughs> falls. Going. The Gravity Falls mocking Journey is a way better song than, than Journey itself. Oh, you can't. Don't, I'm sorry, don't Corey, start can't. unbelieving. Never don't not fear your feelings. That's good writing right there. Oh, okay. You can't. No, don't, don't <laughs> knock. Don't stop believing. I can't. I just can't. I just can't. I just don't know what I don't know what to do with you. I have a, I, I just, I have a part of my soul that really likes Journey and acknowledging that it's very corny. It's very corny music, but it's it's, very it's earnest corny. power ballads. Of course, it's corny. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They all um, have bullets. Mm -hmm. you want? Okay. Okay. Here's here's the story. You know what you need to do, Corey, is just take the midnight train. Like one of these days. <laughs> to you know, just no, just anywhere, right? <laughs> Heading anywhere. We all just need to settle down and remember the wheel in the sky keeps on turning. Yeah. <laughs> it's so boring. Okay, I just want to read this story. Sid Vicious stumbled in, the worst for wear, and addressed Fred. Have you succeeded in bringing ballet to the masses yet? Fred <laughs> casually got up, walked over to him, and said, aren't you Stanley Ferocious or something? And then took him by the collar and threw him out of the room. Yeah, that wow. makes sense. Yeah. That's cool. I will say, um, of all the pistols, it sounds like Johnny Lydon was like the <gasps> least crappy one, which is funny because he's the one who was like Johnny Rotten and then like you know had the persona of being the toughest. But um, yeah, anyhow, uh, welcome to our music. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah free ranging music. Remind stuff. me to make a new thumbnail. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. I'm glad. Welcome, I, I welcome apologize to, to everyone who wanted to hear all about the con experience. Welcome I enjoyed to, it. This is the con experience. I didn't, I didn't, this actually is because this is what was happening behind the table. It was arguing yeah. about. Yeah. Welcome to everyone being offended about Corey's opinions on music. That's, <laughs> that's what it is. I don't know. We've we've all had some hot takes here. I said wings is trash. That's right. I I will defend that, but not right here, not right now. I will say Paul McCartney is a genius, but there's times where genius. I'll throw is one out there. I so I came of age during the grunge thing, and honestly, Nirvana was my least favorite of all of them. There we Ooh. go. There. I'll just Ooh. walk away. That's, That's it. I said it. Walk away now. Walk away. That's it. Just it's out there. Ooh, I, I'd have to attack that a little bit from a later generation, but I will not. We're going to change topics. We're going to get back on. to cons. Yeah. So question about cons. Um, this actually does. Okay. I do have a way to dovetail this back and get us back on the rails. You guys Okay. from the crazy train that we were off the, <laughs> off the rails on. Um, so um, that's, that's a good song. It is a good song. Corey. Oh, I noticed Corey. a, a non-comedy love will find you. That's true. Oh I my hope, gosh! I the hope video not like for that, that Corey. The I just want to say that where it's like, I I think we should all do that actually. Let's do a cover of that video where we all stand like to the side and you kind of do the someday. Love. Anyway, okay. Um, back on the rails. Um, okay. this kind of conversation, like Gary said, can happen at cons, like behind the scenes. And that's another element of conventions that I think personally I, I enjoyed being back there when I did LA Comic Con. I don't know if you guys had any of that kind of engaging with fellow creators going on, but one of the best experiences of doing a con is kind of being in a scenario where suddenly your peers with everybody there who's behind the table, as opposed to the people in front of the table buying stuff. You're all peers and you're all kind of going through this experience together um 
did you guys have any cool moments where you kind of met other exhibitors and uh like would you say that's a value for like you know the discussion of the indie comic creators doing conventions and stuff like that scott why not you i'd be curious to hear your thoughts yeah tell us how bad wings is <laughs> So as, as far as just interactions with other creators, um, let's see, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, one of the things, and the, the video, my video next week, uh, oh my, I have never seen that, that cup. Awesome. Um, wh what was I talking about? Oh Maybe yeah. So next, creators. next, next week, uh, my video, I've got, uh, I've got a bunch of interviews with other creators, uh, indie commerce creators where they just kind of pitch their books and everything. Um, so, I mean, I got to briefly, I didn't, I didn't really get to hang out with other creators so much. I mean, I got to talk with them and everything, but there wasn't, you know, um, there wasn't any of that kind of interaction. Um, I would have liked to, I would have liked to maybe, do something after the show, like go out for drinks or something. But um, I guess I'm just top limber as a creator. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know if you heard that. My girlfriend's like, we went out to uh, this place called Valley Bar, which is a really cool place. So Valley Bar um, is cool. Yeah. So I took her there. She really enjoyed it. So where, it's, where is Valley Bar? Great. I want to hear about this thing. So yeah, Valley Bar is basically, would you compare it to like a speakeasy? Yeah. I mean, the only way to get there is through this back alley. And and most, and I didn't know, like after the show, I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll try this out. I don't know. It could be totally busy with Comic-Con, but I don't think anyone knows only people that know about it know it's i mean it's yeah. not there's no sign or anything it just you walk back this back alley and then there's then you walk down the stairs and and there's a really cool bar in there um so so yeah we there wasn't any problem getting in and everything but it's super cool if you if you ever if you ever come down here josh will we'll definitely go it's got to be a destination yeah yeah as if you make the uh and i i was worried that they didn't survive COVID, but they they did which is awesome so no they did and in yeah. fact they do uh sometimes they do shows there like yeah there was a show there when we went there and I, we were thinking about going but we just kind of wanted to sit down and talk you know um but it sounded from what we could hear it sounded cool and they had a really cool uh, dj was playing like some kind of old school hip hop mixed in with some other stuff. It was really cool. So yeah, it was yeah. an awesome place, but yeah, but it would have been cool to, to get together, but you know, we'll get other chances to do that. Like with the drink and draw, um, I had some other creators uh, and some, some viewers and things of the show who, who were going to try to, you know, stop by the booth, but couldn't make it. So that was kind of a bummer that they didn't get a chance to do that. But um, in general, other than, maybe hanging out with uh, eric henson just a little bit when we were back and forth like trading off at the booth um i didn't really get a chance to do that that so much you know. yeah yeah what about uh what about you gary and also uh just to kind of also bring a little bit of the heat here what do you also think about first did you meet other creators point two after that i think we need to address this as much as philip you are a friend of the channel think we need to address that comment that's that's a hot take that's that's hashtag hot take that i i think is purely to get the clicks and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna engage with it uh second um no i didn't get because i was only there for the day and it was the three of us like together in this sort we had like a corner table yeah um I got I got to meet Scott's girlfriend, which was cool. But uh, in terms of other creators, no, like it it was mostly. But and this is something I think I've talked about in videos before, like working with other creatives, spending time with other creatives. It was just really nice. Like the two guys I was with, everything we're doing is pretty different, and the way we're trying to approach that audience is pretty different. Like uh, Scott Lost, he spent almost the whole time, he was selling comics, but he spent almost the whole time doing likeness drawings. Uh, you know, he put up like, you know, just if you wanted to go up and you wanted to have a drawing of yourself as a Jedi, like he would do that. And he, the whole time he was just drawing uh, the whole the whole day. And then, you know, Keith is uh, primarily a writer. And so he's coming at it from a totally different place. It was nice just to, like I said, and I don't know if this was allowed or not, hopefully the Phoenix Comic Con people aren't watching or the Phoenix Fan Fusion people, but 
we had an igloo behind the table with like some beers and like we were kind of just sipping beers and talking about just you know our pitches and how we would maybe do the table differently next time and picking each other's brains like how would you pitch it and how are you mm -hmm. pitching you know like just and it's really helpful i mean obviously the fans are important and the fans are the ones that are spending money but you know fan fans aren't fellow creators and fans don't really understand what you're doing or how you're doing it or why you're doing it and it's really nice whether it's things like our pastors or tabling with people or whatever drink and draws to like just spend time with other people who are more in your tribe and honestly that's a good pro tip the cooler as well as uh snacks snacks is a good pro tip to yeah because like, you're at a con um if you can snack up you're gonna save yourself a lot of money <laughs> and aside from that like uh it helps you stay at your table during like peak times because unfortunately at cons a lot of your high traffic times and high sales times are like right when people are heading to get food <laughs> and so it's like it's not bad to have like a, a little bit of like snackage um, well you know I will say the under the table um alcohol part might not be all that uncommon i don't know if that's on the up and up but whatever what can you do it's already happened it's over yeah you that that's it. a little tricky like i wouldn't have been able to get up, get away with that because i didn't load in I think in order to do that, you got to load in because I had to go. When you go through security, they check everything. They checked. They poked and probed and they're kind of like, uh, OK, yeah, I think it was, you know, it's one of those jobs. And this is no offense. I've had these jobs. It's one of those jobs where it's all you can do to show up to work. Like they're really not interested in saying, like, is that a beer in there? Like they're just like, whatever. man. So um, but I would say, you know, like um, also you should sneak candy into movie theaters. You should bring <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, the if there was, if I had to bet on who at that show floor made the most money, and Scott, maybe you saw, oh yeah, <laughs> wild guys boy. running the mac and cheese booth. There oh. were guys on the edge ladling up hot mac and cheese. You could get bacon and jalapenos on top if you wanted, and we saw people walking by all day with bowls of mac and cheese. Like that's how we found out about it. We're like. Is that mac and cheese walking by? Like, but I didn't I, even see that. I, didn't I see went that. and got some for lunch. I yeah, well, you had me at mac and cheese. Like the second you mentioned that, I'm like, I want to buy it now. I, right? I, yeah. I thought you were talking about the Wild Bills, the soda. That was the second. Yeah, they, Jim the bought offer. me one of those sodas, and it was the the can the 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 thing was like seventy five bucks. Or something. Yeah, it was like a so it's like a copper, almost like a Moscow. They clean meal. up yeah. at every convention. Yeah. And but that's the that's a good convention, so you bring that to your exactly you yeah that's the yeah yeah i don't know why i pronounced it like refill english is my first language a re it's, it, <laughs> um, it was my but... unique pronunciation at the top which i don't remember the word i was mispronouncing but i think it just it's gotten into the bloodstream <laughs> that's right i forgot it was um not god now i want to remember um, i want to do a callback but i, can't, I yeah. don't have a good enough memory maybe yeah. jim can help us out with that Jim had a really good question saying, uh, um, oh my goodness, we had it. Okay. He said, uh, can you name a convention you wouldn't go to again? Um, yeah. So. Salt Lake Fan X. Yeah, I would, I've heard bad things about them as far as, the, as far as letting in, like the same thing where you've just got the army and like all, you know, everything, that, things that have nothing to do with comics and just... Like or like, like I don't know, like re like having wrestling going on and all kinds of weird stuff. I don't know. Wrestling I've heard that about Salt Lake. <laughs> yeah, I'm like I, I could go for like some wrestling at a con. Just well, because Steam Crow was telling me that cartoonists wrestling each other that would be hilarious. Yeah, Steam Crow was telling me they had I guess the army was there and they had this big bus or big you know some kind of big vehicle thing. I think it was the army and it just like totally blocked the, you know, it was like right in front of oh, them. No. And it was just like, that's the kind of thing is that when people don't pay attention to like the other thing, the one thing I will say that they did it, Phoenix did a really good job with was grouping, grouping uh, like, like, creators together like it seemed yeah. like all the authors was kind of, were kind of together the crafting people were kind of together the independent comics were pretty much together they did a really good job with that i think and yeah. i think that makes sense because you know at least and 
you kind of know where to go if you're looking for a specific thing and everything yeah. and it kind of helps it's the same reason why you know usually a, you'll find a, a a lowe's and a and a home depot next to each other yeah you know, even though you think that's competition it doesn't make sense but it, it kind of gives people an area to go to if they're looking for you know hardware or whatever or restaurants certain, yeah like there's a place there's a place over where i live called Metro Center and literally you're driving down the I-17 and there are three steakhouses right next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, so, but it seemed sense. like it made sense. Yeah. Yeah. I wish there were more curated uh, conventions like that, like in that sense of like curated by like, you know, groups that are similar because I do think that actually helps. It's like curating a bookshop, right? Where it's like you have a section of a bookstore. So if somebody is looking for like, uh, like they're a history buff and they're just looking for the next historical fiction thing. They can go to historical fiction. Right. And then like near there are other things that might interest them. But I, I do think that's a good idea. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Gary? Uh, cons you would never do again. I, you know, actually it would, the only con I've ever, there's only two cons I've ever gone to uh, Phoenix fan fusion, comic con, all the different incarnations it's had and uh dino con, phoenix dino con and dino con doesn't exist anymore so that's on the table the only bad experiences i've had are like bad incarnations of the phoenix one where like i mm -hmm. felt like they didn't like like 2019 where if if i knew that it was always going to be like 2019 i would not go back yeah. i like it um i would say the worst one in the world that I ever went to was Wizard World in Los Angeles. And for an indie cartoonist who doesn't do superhero books, that was like a nightmare. Now keep in mind that was over a decade ago, so maybe it's changed since. But at the time that was like not a good place if you're doing like the Chester Brown kind of stuff. Like it's just not, it's not a very uh, indie friendly place. The only con I've ever been to where people literally picked up my books and were like, ah, I'm more into capes and tights. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm supposed to snarkily say that as an indie creator. Like, you don't say that about yourself, about the indie. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, but uh, let's see. Oh, my gosh. We're at like an hour and 30 minutes. Well, we um, spent 45 minutes talking about Prince <laughs> Michael Jackson and Wings. That's true. Okay, Paul has one good question that maybe we can wrap it with or, or get close to wrapping if you guys are going. Although, honestly, we could have another 30-minute debate on music. Um, we could. We could. Yeah. Um, okay, explain to me how Kendrick Lamar is the best uh, hip-hop musician alive and uh, tell me every reason why I'm right on that. That's what I want to hear. No, I'm, just, I, I, I'm going to play I, the Corey part and say, like, I couldn't tell you if I've ever heard of Kendrick Lamar. Anymore. Yeah, on your recommendation, Josh, I listened to it, and it wasn't for me. It's not, not my It's favorite. a heavy album, though. It's a very heavy album. But yeah. it's, it's which which album did you try out? The newer one. I've heard uh, I've heard other of his albums. I just, I don't know. It's just that it's not, it's not my kind of hip hop, really. Shame. Shame. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Paul was saying, who's the biggest celebrity you've met at a con? Oh. Uh, let's try to limit it in one, because I'm sure one. Yeah, in one or two. Uh, let's say maybe two max. Okay. Who's going first? We're talking I'll just biggest... say, I, I don't really go there for celebrities, so I don't, I never stood in line for a celebrity or anything like that. I, if I, as far as just I mean, other than other comic creators like Art Adams or something like that, but I don't know. I, I just, I really don't kind of like Corey's opinion of yeah, Prince and Michael I was, Jackson. I, I don't ask, have one. I was going to ask biggest celebrity or biggest celebrity we care about. Uh, I, it doesn't matter. I Although mean, to, to kind of chime in on what Corey was saying, if Weird Al was there, I would get a, I might get a little starstruck. I will. I feel, back like, I feel like Scott, you've got my back on the Weird Al thing. I oh, will yeah, back oh, no doubt about it on the Weird Al Live thing, too. He used to play up here as a kid at the fairgrounds, yeah. um, which is, like, weird in Navy because mostly country bands don't come out here. And I will tell you, like, it, he is a phenomenal musician and um, incredible performer and hilarious. So and if I you've only heard his parody on stuff, you don't know. But he's not better than Michael Jackson. <laughs> I didn't like, say he was better. I never said he was better. 
Anyway, you clearly uh, said Michael Jackson is a hack compared to Weird Al Yankovic. We all heard it. Play oh the tape God. back. You guys, do uh, we have to back up? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll be fast. Ryan, Ryan Utley is the the biggest name that I've that I've met in person that I care about. Nice. At, at what about con. what about the biggest name that you don't care about? Just because you qualify. Um, yeah, that, I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, Lou Ferrigno, probably, or oh, that's um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, whatever. He's fine. Lou Ferrigno used to be at San Diego Comic Con every year, and that's, and that's where I met him. Every con, almost everywhere. Yeah, shocking. I, like even locally, yeah. like I had yeah. a gig where I can't say what dark pirate ship we were involved in producing for San Diego Comic Con. Um, but but I I was there to film, uh, you know the the three semi trucks that it took to drive that Got it. dark pirate ship. No connection to, to like a current trial or anything like that. With the uh, yeah, system. I don't know. I I I uh, yeah. There's um, there's some connection. Uh, yeah, but no, I was down there, and that's I, and I had and that was before I had gotten back into comics. And so I didn't even know that Artist Alley existed. And I got myself in and I was on the job. So I had to like film the whole day, the whole three days that I was there. I was like shooting footage of everything. And so like when you're working, you never enjoy it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then after the fact, I'm looking through my footage and I'm like, that place was freaking rad. Like I kind of wish I would have gotten to go rather than work. Like being a food vendor at a really cool situation, but you never get to see anything but the outside or the inside of your booth. But anyway, I, I met I met Lou Ferrigno and I I met a couple uh, uh, a, a couple of people down there that were kind of in and around, kind of as peppered into my peppered into my film as kind of a uh, uh, characters. Nice. So cool. yeah, but yeah, right. Cool. Ryan, Ryan Otley, I think would be I think it'd be my top. Um, I also met. Uh, I, oh man, my street cred is going to go way down. He's he just died and he's really huge for what he did with Batman. Neil Adams. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Well, I've seen Neil Adams. Yeah. Yeah, and I did not like that experience at all. Oh. Yeah, uh, he's an unpleasant person. Oh, interesting. Um, That's interesting. Though everybody has their off days, so I don't want to paint or, him. I don't want to paint him as you know as whatever. But yeah. Yeah, actually, I will say like any of us having like possible negative con stories it's it's always like it's always an odd thing where you could literally have just caught somebody maybe they right. haven't had lunch yet or whatever you know whatever yeah. it is yeah. um uh okay gary what about you celebrities uh, uh probably, let's say like comic i guess we'll separate it by comic and then just generic celebrity okay comic and generic celebrity okay comic this is only vaguely comic but i was at uh I, I paid to get a photograph with Leonard Nimoy, uh, AKA Mr. Spock. And uh, this was probably 2017 or 18. I don't remember which one I was, it was a con I was actually, I had a table at and I got away to go and get a picture with him. And uh, I felt bad about it because they had him, he was very elderly and they had him propped up he might have actually passed away several years before, but they they he he was propped up on a stool and uh, looking straight ahead at the camera, just smiling at this camera. And you would come in it's like someone would like have you come in. And I went up and I was like, um, Mr. Nimoy, it's a pleasure. And without even turning to look at me. So I'll do like my view. He's looking at the camera, which is over here. It's mm -hmm. like, That's great. And didn't even look at me and just like and so then you stand next to him and they take the picture and he never he was dead still the entire time you could tell all he did was just sit and smile at the camera all day long while people went through for pictures so that's a comic related person uh in terms of celebrity i was at san diego comic-con i was walking the floor and i walked by this woman who my out of my peripheral vision i thought looked like she was wearing like it was like some kind of a cosplay thing she just looked she stood out and as she passed me, I realized, like, I think that's 
Dita Von Tees. If you're familiar with Dita Von Tees, famous, uh, yes, okay. And I, so I stopped and turned around and watched this woman go. And I was like, you can't, that, she wouldn't just be walking the floor. And like, I kind of backtracked and went past her to kind of see her from the front again, to see if it was indeed her, tried to be very natural about it. And it was totally her. And I went up to her and I was like, hi, I'm sorry. Like, you're Dita Von Tees, right? And she was like, yes. I was like, could I get a picture with you? I'll post this on my Facebook later for those who are interested. And she was like, sure. And her bodyguard, who was enormous, like, I mean, just the biggest man I've ever seen in my life. He took my camera and took a picture of me with Dita Von Tees. Uh, but she, it was funny because she could blend at a con because she... She looks like you see her all the time. Like you would just think like, oh, I don't know. This is some yeah. weird pinup, 50s pinup thing, you know? And like, I bet nobody was stopping. She was in the crowd, like walking, you know, and no one was mobbing her. But. I had a, I had a similar experience with, um, oh my gosh. I must be really ill right now because I cannot remember names. Never mind. <laughs> Carry on. It'll come back to me. A similar experience. Yeah. Right. Well, no, it was... This is even more embarrassing than not remembering Neil Adams, but um, oh. the guy, the Marvel guy, like the main Marvel guy. Oh, Stan, Stan Lee? Lee? Stan Lee, yeah. There we go. So, yeah, I, I recognize Stan Lee, who was at uh, at NAM, not at, and so, because I, I exhibited at NAM as an exhibitor for, uh, I don't know, six years, twice a year uh, for a while. And um, so I was always there before the show opened. And uh, and so like it's only exhibitors, and he's just walking, and I was like, oh, that's that's Stanley. And then as soon as I recognized that, even though it's only exhibitors, there was about a hundred and fifty people that just like immediately started a crowd following him, and he yeah. was briskly walking somewhere. Uh, but it was by himself, and I watched it happen, and I was like, I don't even know where all those people came from. But it was yeah, it was very bizarre. He was by himself for a little bit. But like, probably, probably, you know, a hundred feet into the show floor, and then it was immediately mobbed. Yeah, but yeah, that was interesting. Nice. Um, so my two, uh, like for comics, I, I pulled this story before, but my first time boothing at a con uh, was Ape, and this is like back in two thousand something, like two thousand seven, maybe, <laughs> like a while back. Um, and uh, um, at the time, like Alternative Press. Um, or, oh, sorry. Oh my gosh. Now I'm even, I was blanking out on what they were called. Alternative <laughs> comics, which was run by Contagious. Jeff Mason, helped me distribute, um, numb my first comic. And he let me use their table space. And so I'm like boothing with all these guys that I'd never met. And it's, you know, a lot of them ended up being really cool, amazing cartoonists and stuff like that. But I remember at one point I kind of, um, I'm like sitting like I am here, right, with the like with a chair that has like a back, and I just kind of look back like this, and I'm like, wait, I recognize that like kind of bald spot on that hair, like it's not a bald spot, but it's kind of like a little messy, longer hair, very gray, a little bit, you know, kind of low posture, and then I'm like, wait a second, and I see, oh, he's signing, okay, he's signing mouse, oh, okay. Oh my gosh, I'm literally back to back with Art Spiegelman. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so um, I got a picture. I'd, I'd have to dig, but my wife uh, took a picture with me and Art Spiegelman. And I was like, probably to this day, um, I, I met Spain Rodriguez uh, much later with, um, at like a word uh, convention, like a book convention called Wordstock in uh, Portland, Oregon. But I will say, Nobody compares to Art Spiegelman for like cartoonists I've met and how yeah. geeked out I felt. Like most of the time, I'll be like, you know, I respect them, I admire them. They're just human beings. But somebody like Art Spiegelman, it's it's. I know he's just a human being, but also he wrote one of like. Sometimes some people could argue like the best comic, but at least at minimum one of the best comics ever written. Um, and so that was kind of a cool moment. I do have a quick one I want to slip in. I'll Go for it. I did meet, I did have a funny meeting with Warren Ellis once. Oh, nice. Who I, so when I was working for Village Voice, he was coming to do a signing. He had written a book 
um, I don't remember the name of it now. He had written a novel and he was going to a comic book store to do a signing. And so I was working at Village Voice in the local paper and I wrote up the blurb saying like Warren Ellis is going to be at this comic book shop. You know, you can get stuff signed. He had a new comic coming out. Uh, and this book at the same time, he was signing copies of those. They'd be for sale at the store, blah, 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 blah. So I thought, well, uh, I, I had a copy of the book. I still, oh, it's, I think it was like Crooked Little Vein or something. I have it somewhere in my shelf. And um, I read it and I did like also like a short review, just like a tiny one paragraph kind of summary slash of review of the book in this mm -hmm. blurb. I show up at the signing because I was like, well, I got the book and I wrote the thing. Maybe I could get him to sign both. I can get him to sign the book and the thing. <laughs> the two big takeaways. First of all, I saw he had two bottles of Jack Daniels next to him uh, at the chair, one half empty. And he had absolutely drank that first half. When I got up to him at the mm -hmm. table, like you could smell it. It was unbelievable. Okay, so that was number one. Number two is when I got up, I was like, uh, Mr. Ellis, pleasure to meet you. I'd love it if you could uh, autograph your book here. And also like I wrote up this event, like there's a whole line, you know, I was like, I wrote up this event and like, I was hoping maybe you could just sign, you know, like this little thing where I, I wrote up the event and he's like, you wrote it up. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, what'd you write? And I was like, oh, I just wrote about like the book and, and you know, that you were going to be here. And he's like, <laughs> let me, let me see. So I handed it to him and he, it was the most awkward tense. It felt like a thousand years. He sat with his bleary Jack Daniels eyes and read the entire thing that I had written in like the village voice, like while I'm standing there. And now I'm, my head's racing. Like, what did I say? I hope I didn't say anything snarky because your village voice, you're trying to like punch stuff up. It's like, I hope I didn't say anything shitty about his book. Mm -hmm. Like just, you know, and it, I was just sitting there frozen in terror and he just read, 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 read. And then finally after forever, like, autographed the, the new times and gave it back to me and like didn't say a word didn't say a word about it yes or no or thank you or anything it was very awkward but that i got to meet more nice nice um okay so my celebrity one the the big like celebrity or whatever that you know like living near la you meet a lot of like celebrities so big deal they're people right but this one was like hilarious because it's somebody you know who's like kind of legendary and just the way it happened that's why i'm going to bring this one up because i've had multiple ones at con con conventions conventions are promoting movies and <laughs> celebrities, right but i'm walking through the comic convention and this like really buff short guy just mm, knocks into me actually i bump into him and then i'm like sorry 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 and he's like oh it's, it's okay and walks past and i just keep walking and then I think it's like my my now wife, but at the time I think we were just engaged. Um, but my fiance turns to me and is just like, "That was a that was Henry Rollins." Oh, and I turn around and I look and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, it's Henry Rollins." <laughs> is he short? Oh my gosh, yeah. No, he's I, I mean he's that. huge, but he's really short. Yeah, he's he was buff. Like, he came up to like here, like his head was like up to my chin. Wow, and I, I just. I, I've gone to one of his spoken word things yeah. like, a few years ago, and it was awesome. But yeah, I didn't no, realize he was on stage, so I didn't realize he was short. Yeah, so it's this is a funny thing. I've had that experience with meeting other people who've like been on TV and stuff, where they, quite often that's a, a pretty common response of like, "Wow, that, this person looks a lot shorter." Yeah. That's know? actually what Josh said when we first met in person. He's like, yeah. "Wow, you're actually significantly shorter than I thought." Yeah, and and Corey and I, I thought it was the kind same of way where I was looking loud. for well, Corey and I just yeah. <laughs> just bump right in. No. <laughs> But anyway, it was funny because it's like it was just one of those like, oh, wow, I was accidentally extremely because I think I was like heading to this is back when I used to go to the that was at Comic-Con just as an attendee. And so I think I was trying to get to like Hall H or something for like a, a thing. And so I was rushing yeah. and being slightly rude and then bumped into Henry Rollins. What are the um, odds? That and I'm lucky because like, honestly, that guy is short, but he could still murder me very oh, easily. Oh, he's yeah. a monster. Yeah, he's huge. Well, yeah. the energy level he has, it's oh, crazy. Yeah. I don't, yeah. yeah but. And and one of the, like, you know, uh, um, regardless of what you think about his music, like, probably one of the best spokespeople for punk rock, I'd say, like, next to, like, Ian McKay. So. Yeah. 
All right. Um, we did our celebrity. Well, or aside from maybe Nickelback, I don't know. Oh, that's I don't know. That's a legendary band that you know. I'm sure um, Jim will talk all about the brilliance of. Um, uh, all right. So, Gary, we we got a little. A little derailed in a fun way, and sure uh, yeah, apologize. no. What th- th- this is partially like when there are streams anywhere on my channel, they derail and get into crazy debates. That's just what I do. <laughs> and I'm glad to apologize because I had nothing to do with it. And so, yeah. thank you for <laughs> that's true. Yeah, Gary. Appreciate that. That is true. Um, and journey is awesome. Uh, journey so. Is awesome. Yeah, it is. Uh, you got to like give it another chance and just kind of embrace the Go journey. To Spotify, get Journey's greatest hits. Just that's yeah, all. Can I, can, I, can I tell a quick closing journey story to, to really <laughs> solidify this? This Take isn't on the journey. Corey. This isn't yeah, this isn't an opinion that I'm that I'm like it's like, you know, decades old. Uh, you know how like old band tees became really popular within the last couple of years or whatever. So I have a rule in my home that you can wear a tee, but you have to like some of their songs. And so my wife bought my wife bought my daughter a Journey shirt because my wife likes classic rock and you know I don't know. So I was like, okay, sounds like your wife is a woman of taste, of course. Yeah. Well, like classic like rock. my my classic. daughter. Okay, so so. So my daughter and my wife, they listen to like show tunes together and everything. My daughter and I listen to like Panic at the Disco and Fall Out Boy and, you know, like kind of early 2000 pop punk stuff. And uh, anyway, so she has varied tastes. And I'm like, okay, you can keep this shirt if you can, if you like any of these songs. And so I went on Spotify and we spent an entire drive driving to salt lake city which is about four hours listening to journey in order of popularity and we made it in about 90 minutes into that when before scarlet was like can we please stop i never want to wear this shirt again this is so boring and i was like thank you so much i didn't have to say a word like they have half of one good song and then it, that's it Ah, oh, Ooh, I'm trying to wrap Ooh. this screen, but it just keeps. Oh. Um, ah, of okay. one. I'll give him. It's it's a hook. Like it's it's a good hook. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I I am not sure how we wrap this up. Okay. Um, I do like that story. I will say, I, I dig Journey, and it's it start. It, it's kind of like um, this happened with Marvin Gaye for me too, where originally when I first listened to Marvin Gaye, it, I think I was doing it almost like sarcastically, like when I was younger, I would like listen to Marvin Gaye and be like, yeah, you know, it's like romantic music, <laughs> and then like about a year into like trying to do it like all kind of snarkily and sarcastically, I was like, this is some of the best music ever like right. and uh, like with no joking uh there and i feel that way about like um a lot of like soul and funk and like blues and stuff it might start as like kind of like i don't know maybe there's a a tinge of humor to it or whatever but then like you you see the deeper element of it i will say journey was exactly the same thing where i originally was like i'm gonna listen to this because it's very over the top and corny Mm-hmm. And then I kind of fell in love with it because it's over the top and corny and makes no apologies. <laughs> right. uh, I, and that's fine. And I, I don't begrudge anybody liking it. I do have a problem with the argument of acquired taste. Like if, yeah, if I have to like acquire the taste of it, like, and this is like food and everything else. It's like, Whiskey. it's going to be horrifically disgusting at first, but then after a while you can kind of acquire it. Like, it's like, if I don't immediately like it, then why? 
There's well, so much out there. That's, why would I that's my opinion on beer. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's why I don't drink IPAs. Yeah, so I don't. Oh my yeah. gosh, you guys, you guys are bringing up so many fighting words before we wrap. So, so Josh, <laughs> like you're insulting you're like, everything I love. So Josh, there's like this fire that's raging, and then it and then it, and then it dies down, and there's a couple embers, mm-hmm. and then I'm just the guy with the gasoline that's like, yeah, gasoline. At the you've got the big yeah. bellows that well, you're no. like. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. feel like Scott was dropping the nuclear bombs with the ipa dish there i'm like don't don't trash the ipa well I, I didn't say anything about IPA. I, that was beer in general yeah. oh, i don't yeah. drink beer at all yeah. i don't like it so it was gary and again gonna drink that to uh, no like Corey. basically that's my attitude about ipas it's like no no no. it's supposed yeah. to taste like cat piss you don't understand right. you're not appreciating <laughs> I, i've never had it's beer, supposed to it's taste just... like you're chewing on a mouthful of pine needles it's, it's it, exactly it all... what you're trying to be <laughs> It all smells like that. that. It all smells like some varying degree of rotting urine. I don't understand yeah. the appeal. But. Yeah. So yeah. I, I I have to say, though, like, I think very quickly, well, we, we got to kick away. Because <laughs> I'm like, I want to talk about acquired taste because I'm like, I can very quickly get you to agree that acquired taste is important, especially in art, because a young yeah. art student who doesn't know anything about art is going to be have a different take on art then when they actually start diving into the history of it, exploring it, doing the practice of it, suddenly like, for me, like a, a good example would be like cartoon modern, where it's like, that's a style that I think before I did art, I wasn't like that fond of. Um, and then as I started doing art and drawing, I was like, I started falling in love with it because it has so much design and sophisticated <laughs> nature to it. And we can't get into that back and forth. So let's wrap it up. Um, so basically, I think the, the takeaway from this is uh, make your own decision about comic conventions. I would say if you guys are going to do it, uh, you know, listen to this stream, listen to other people's advice on cons. And I would just heavily recommend don't just go there with the expectation to make money, um, because frankly, you shouldn't be doing comics just to make money. There's better fields with way more money <laughs> than, than comics. There's got to be more, uh, more to it than just the money part, um, I think to make good comics and to have fun and have a successful convention. Um, that being said, let's do the go around and let everybody know where to find um, our stuff. Um, also, thanks to the chats. We had a really lively, awesome chat. And it's funny, um, Jim was trying to keep us going and, and have us bring up Corey Feldman albums, which I think is <laughs> hilarious. Um, that could be a whole other, other wormhole. Um, but anyhow, uh, so you're on my channel. If you haven't yet, hit subscribe, hit the bell. Uh, you know, bell gives you notifications when I'm when we're about to go live, especially on live streams that I do a lot on this channel. Um, and then, of course, uh, pre-order Jacob's apartment, my graphic novel, and uh, make sure you bought two stories. Um, Corey, where can everybody find your stuff? You can find my stuff at coreycur.com and. Uh... Yeah, I've been really sick for the last month, so I haven't done much. But you can see some of that stuff on social media. If you click on what's new, you will see old things because that's that's how it's gone so far. So, yeah. I like it. And I will say, make sure you guys are following Corey on uh, Instagram because he does post like little pics of his progress um, right now of his uh, comic that he's been working on. It's really cool to see. So uh, I encourage you guys to be following that and, uh, and whatnot. Gary, where can everybody find your incredible story about dinosaurs versus Marsbots? Are there any copies left? Did you there sell There are out? copies left. There are fewer than I expected because I sold a few more than I expected at the con, but there are some left. So get them while they're hot at my Etsy shop. You can find it uh, either through my YouTube, which is under my name, Gary Hodges, which, by the way, I do a weekly live stream uh, Saturday mo- late mornings, 11 a.m. Arizona time. Uh, so there'll be one in just a couple days. There's a link there to the Etsy shop. You can also find it, uh, on my Instagram, which is dinosaurs vs Mars bots, dinosaurs uh, versus Mars bots. Both are still available right now. I think, I think this one's a little bit lower in quantity left, but they're both still around. So go check them out. And then I want to slip in one thing. Everyone's talking about Kenobi this, Kenobi that. You know, the real must-see TV of the summer is going to be Jim Lujan's Sugar Machine, which Mm. I have seen, and it's fantastic. Chef's Kiss. It's amazing. I think it releases Monday. 
maybe even earlier. I don't know. A little bird told me you never know when it might drop. So be sure to be following Jim Lujan and uh, check out his latest masterwork. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to to gel Jim that I saw it and it was great. So yeah, yeah, yeah and uh, and I believe Gary might actually you know be a voice. In I have a small part, a small part, and it's not why I'm uh, I'm not doing it for the crazy royalties. I'm not pushing for the you know driving people to watch so I can retire early. I'm uh, doing it because it was hilarious. I think it might be my favorite one of his yet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would say it's a really good one. Um, and uh, I also want to throw out there that Jim, uh, don't forget to mail him the check. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, so Scott, where can everybody um, find your work and how do they keep track of this crazy channel? Uh, the show that goes, uh, you know, all over the place. We go off the rails on topics. We go off the rails on whose channel it's going to be on. Well, look, we're crazy. We're a crazy show, you guys. Um, and and uh, if you guys are supporting us and you're interested in our awesome show, um, how can people uh, keep track of this this uh, insanity that we do, Scott? Yeah, yeah. So, well, first of all, I'll just tell everyone where they can find me. You can find yes. my work at CircWorks.com. Uh, you can find my videos on uh, on YouTube. Just search CircWorks on YouTube. And uh, just be aware that the Kickstarter for Young and the Dead uh, will be launching next month. I'm going to start pitching that and, and talking about that heavily leading up to that. So uh, I've got uh, a couple, actually a couple of the artists here. Well, one of them already did it. Uh, Corey's work. Josh has already done a co cover. Uh, weird else. <laughs> oh, I'm Corey's, sorry. Corey's working on a cover. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. And, and Gary will be working on a cover as well. So so we'll have some cool variant covers and everything. Um, really looking forward to, to getting that going. Um, but as Josh mentioned, the show we do every single week, the art casters uh, typically on Thursday nights, but it could be on a different night. It is usually on a different channel. Uh, it rotates from Josh's channel to Corey's channel to my channel and then back again. Um, Typically, we have a different guest each show, and that can get a little confusing, so we try to make it easy for you. And what we do is we have a newsletter. You can sign up. There's a link in the description of this video. Join the newsletter, and we will send out usually about 30 minutes ahead of time. Um, we'll send out an invite, and it's going to tell you who the guest is going to be, whose channel it's on. All that stuff so the, uh, you know because youtube doesn't always inform people and even if you subscribe to channels and things you you may not be uh alerted to a new episode so just join the mailing list and we don't spam you or anything like that we just send uh we just send out uh that that newsletter about 30 minutes ahead of time so definitely check that out all right you guys um Oh, oh, we're gonna get you're gonna get started. I'm gonna get demonetized. Yeah, but uh but I will say um be a small town girl in a lonely world and change your mind about journey today. And with that, this has been a late night AM radio station and we're signing. <laughs>